So we're kind of going to focus in on, on homosexuality tonight. All right. Well, welcome to Wednesday evening Bible study. Let's, uh, let's start our time with a word of prayer. Um, Father in heaven, thank you again for your word to us. Thank you that it, it can guide us through this uh, very <laughs> treacherous world at times. We thank you for the truth of it tonight, and uh, thank you that it does um, very often speak directly to uh, issues that are even contemporary right now, because there really is nothing new under the sun, um, and uh, Lord, whether indirectly or directly, you address everything that we might encounter in this life. So thank you for its guidance, its, its teaching, and just pray that you would be our teacher tonight. It is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. All right, so we have been going through lots and lots of, of contemporary issues in our world, looking at how the world views certain things that are going on, um, how they respond to those things, and then at the same time looking at how the Bible views these very same things and how we as believers should respond to them. And there are a lot, of, a lot of issues taking place in our world right now. And I think it is important that we, we respond in a, in a, a proper biblical way um, so that we can be a, a testimony of Christ to those around us. Um, next to the topic of human value and abortion, uh, tonight's topic is probably one of the most devastating to uh, human society because what it does is it perverts and destroys uh, one of the most important building blocks of society. And we looked at that building block last week. What was it? Family. Family. Okay, well, this issue, this contemporary issue tonight destroys that building block. It's one of the things that can, probably the one that most adversely affects it. It perverts the family. It perverts the husband and wife relationship. Um, our subject tonight, uh, broadly, is, is sexual perversion. And right up front, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to, I'm going to try to keep this at a, a PG level, all right? We're not going to talk about any details or anything like this. This should be suitable for, for anybody 12 and, and up, but um, for those that are maybe under the 18 years, 18 years of age, uh, parents, you may need to guide them, answer some questions afterwards. But anyway, um, I think probably the best place to start here tonight, though, would be to define the word pervert. <laughs> Uh, the word pervert in verb form is actually a very general term uh, that refers to the turning away from what is true or, or good or morally right. Uh, so perverting something is turning away from that which is right. Um, in, in, in short, it's, it's to misuse something. Uh, pervert in the noun form is uh, someone who does the above, all right? It turns, turns aside, um, misuses something. So therefore, sexual perversion is the turning aside or away from what is good and true and, and sexually right. It's to mis misuse sexuality. Um, rape. Rape is a, a sexual perversion. And both the Bible and the world, um, for the most part, agree completely that, that rape is wrong. Um, in fact, in our world today, rape is probably considered to be one of the most uh, heinous of crimes, um, as it is in the Bible. In fact, let's look at a passage that deals with, with rape just quickly in the Bible, just kind of to open up our topic here tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 22. 
Deuteronomy chapter 22. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy, chapter 22. And I'm just going to read you a couple of verses from this chapter, beginning in verse 23. And what these verses give us is, is two different scenarios. One of them is, is a definite rape scenario. Of course, it's describing the fact of, of how wrong it is. But let me just give it to you here. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 23 through 27, it says, If a young woman who is a virgin is betrothed to a husband, and a man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you, then you shall bring them both out of the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife, so you shall put away the evil from among you. That's the first scenario. Here's the second one, and this is actually the, the rape scenario here. It says, but if a man finds a betrothed woman in the countryside, and, and the man forces her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. There is in the young woman no sin deserving of death, for just as when a man rises against his neighbor and kills him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the countryside, the betrothed young woman cried out, but there was no one to save her. Now, a couple things as we address these two scenarios, okay? First of all, a betrothed woman or a betrothed young woman is addressed here mostly because at this time, uh, by the time a, a young woman has even just entered puberty, um, her future husband was, was probably already picked out. Arranged marriages were not uncommon during this period of time, and that's what betrothed means. Secondly, in the first scenario, the implication is that she consented, all right, because she did not cry out for help to be heard and saved. So here we find the civil consequences of what could be called either adultery or fornication, which is also a sexual perversion in the Bible, and that's why both parties were punished. But thirdly, and my point really in bringing up this passage, is that that rape scenario. The man forces her and lies with her even though she cried out for help. So my question here is, how serious does God take that scenario in this passage? And how do you know it's very serious? Okay, the penalty, by, penalty of death. In fact, the rape is actually equ equated to murder, as serious as murder in that passage. Well, God hates all kinds of sin, all kinds of, of sexual perversion. Um, sexual perversion is a, a very, very, very serious in the eyes of God. So God has gone to, to great lengths uh, to not only describe what sexual perversion is, and we're going to look at numerous passages here tonight, um, basically a list of them, all right? But it also describes why he hates it so. It does pervert what he originally created to be good, true, natural, beautiful, productive. And God hates it because it takes what he's made as good and turns it into something that is, that is ugly, unnatural, a destroyer of, of families and marriages and societies and lives. So once again, godly lives matter. Our godly lives matter. Uh, godly lives exemplify um, God's purposes. They, they have made a difference in the past, and they can do so now. So let's look, first of all, at the worldly view of sexual perversion. And as we've been going through these uh, contemporary issues, we have a, basi a basic four-point outline we've been going through. We'll look at the worldly view, then the worldly response, 
the biblical view, and then the biblical response. Well, first, the worldly view, and uh, I'll just, I just got it in statement form, statement form here, but the worldly view of sexual perversion is perverted. And, and, and I, 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 I'll explain that here. Um, do you remember the definition of the word pervert, right? Well, what is it? All right, to turn aside from that is good to misuse something. Well, the term sexual perversion is actually being misused today, all right? The world is even perverting the view of sexual perversion because things that used to be considered sexually perverted, the world doesn't see them as sexually perverted anymore. It's actually perverting the, the definition. Okay, and it's doing this in, in, in two ways. Well, probably more than two, but I've got two for you here tonight. Number one, in the, the, the world, and, and I, I, when I say the world, I don't mean everybody in the world, but based the, the, the encompassing way of the world, the worldly way of doing things. Here's the first way that they're perverting sexual perversion is they're redefining what it is. They're redefining what sexual perversion is. Um, the Columbia Encyclopedia states, and this is a modern encyclopedia, states that sexual perversion in psychology is sexual behavior deemed pathological by its deviation from normal sexual desire. It says that the definition of sexual perversion has shifted considerably over time. For example, homosexual desire has long been stigmatized as sexual perversion, but within the field of psychology, it is no longer considered pathological. Uh, use of the term perversion itself has come under wide criticism in recent years. This is still the Columbia Encyclopedia. Today, they say psychologists generally refer to non-traditional sexual behavior as sexual deviation, okay? Or in cases where it's rather unusual, it's called paraphilia. But sexual perversion, the term, is, is hardly even used anymore because these things are becoming more and more accepted. So fetishism, voyeurism, pedophilia, exhibitionism, incest, transvestism, necrophilia, sadism, um, these are all things that are no longer considered sexual perversion but paraphilia. A, a, little, a little bit of a, a um, pushed down term, not so, not so dramatic, right? Um, it also says, although rape is not classified as a par paraphilia, that is still considered a sexual perversion. So my point being, the world is still seeing rape as, as a very, very serious, uh, heinous crime. But just to sum up what I just read to you from the Columbia Encyclopedia, it said, where homosexuality used to be considered a sexual perversion, it is now just an accepted deviation. Where pedophilia used to be considered a perversion, it and things like it are now just pathological abnormalities. But rape, rape is still seen as serious. So, does anyone see a problem with redefining sexual perversion? Who is deciding it? Okay, number one, who's deciding it? And we'll, we'll turn to the National Library of Medicine to see that in just a minute. But what, 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 what's the problem with things shifting like that? It deviates from God's word? It deviates from God's word? Who, who, Okay, there it is, yeah. Pretty soon, rape will be okay. E even using the word pathological with these, time, with these terms implies that while they may be out of the norm, 
it is the path that society is going down. And if it continues to move down that path, rape could one day be acceptable. Now, right now, the world would say, that's crazy. That's crazy. You're, you're talking crazy. Society will never allow something as detestable as rape to be accepted. Well, it already is in some cultures, and that is, uh, that, that is, and that is what this society used to say about homosexuality, right? Yet here we are. So number one, the world is redefining sexual perversion. And then number two, it's letting society, Mindy, you just, that's who decide. They, they let the society decide what is moral. Um, the National Library of Medicine says, sexual perversion is a very controversial matter and difficult to define because of, instead of being analyzed as a clinical phenomenon, it's seen as a social one. Society is the ones who are establishing, establishing what is perverse and what is not. They say if we analyze the evolution of sexuality, we would find many sexual practices considered acceptable today that were at one time forbidden. And we do. However, therein lies the problem with society deciding what is perverse and what is not. Uh, what used to be perver perverse becomes acceptable. Um, no, but you and I, I, I pray that we know that there has to be a standard that is beyond man. Uh, for even in their own words, if there isn't, it is going to continue to evolve. It's going to continue going down that path, uh, really devolve, okay? Because what we've seen even by uh, the world as detestable today is it becomes acceptable tomorrow, and the proof is in the past. Uh, the worldly view of sexual perversion is perverted. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, but Isaiah chapter 5 verses 20 and 21 says, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Uh, what kind of a passage is that? What's, what's the tone of the passage? What's that? It's a, it's a warning. A warning against what? Perversion. Perversion, putting evil for good and good for evil, right? That, that, that really, that's exactly, that is exactly what the world is doing. So the worldly response then, the worldly response is to accept past evils as good in the present. Um, th they wouldn't agree that that's what they're doing, but history shows us that that is exactly, that is exactly what they're doing. They're, they're, they're accepting past evils as good in the present. Now, because sexual perversion is evolving, devolving in the world, because it is being redefined, I'm going to focus the rest of our evening mostly on, uh, on uh, one particular area um, that is probably more of a contemporary issue than any other. So we're kind of going to focus in on, on homosexuality tonight because that, is, that would probably be the, the biggest contemporary issue within this, uh, this perversion topic that we're looking at. There are other areas that are rapidly gaining acceptance, um, uh, even being defended by the world, uh, like fetishism, exhibitionism, incest, transvestism, and sadism. Uh, they are all on the path of becoming um, normal in the world's eyes. 
In fact, technically speaking, um, exhibition has probably been a, a norm longer than homosexuality has. Uh, but we're going to focus on that, that homosexuality aspect because it is uh, the, the biggest contemporary issue um, in the realm of this topic. So how did we get to where we are? Uh, where did it begin? Uh, what, what do you think? How, how, how does the world go down the path from it being a perversion to accepted? What, what do you guys think? Gary? Politics. Politics? Okay, that, that's probably the number one, but for, uh, so certainly, yes, yeah, suppressing the truth of God, but even, even 50, 75 years ago, there were people that didn't know the Lord that saw homosexuality as a perver per perversion. So how did we go down this road? Break down the family unit. Vic, go ahead. Television. There's more shows where <laughs> one of the characters is the homosexual of the group, and they are portrayed as the anchor, the intelligent one. They are now. Mm -hmm. They are now. They didn't. They were the comic relief early on. They were the, the guilty sin of, but, but I think you're right. I think media has been very instrumental in that. So any other thoughts on what brought us down this path, Gary? Well, the reason I mentioned politics is California passed a law where you can have sex with a child as young as 14 years old, as long as you're no more than 10 years older than them. But the interesting thing about it is it really only... regards to homosexuality, because a 24-year-old man can't have sex with a 14-year-old girl, but he can have sex with a 14-year-old boy. Wow, okay, because didn't know that. They are saying the kids need to be meant for it. Okay, but that had to be voted in, right? Yeah, and it was signed by the governor. Okay. And isn't it really legalizing rape? Because a 14-year-old can't make a valid decision. Right, right. No, I agree, yeah, yeah. But the people had to vote that in. So what happened in the hearts of people that brought us down that path? Oh, is that right? Okay, okay, all right. So it wasn't even voted in. It wasn't on the proposition ballot at all. Wow, okay, okay. Mindy. Okay, okay. Just going along with I, I heard a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. As, yes, that is a crime, but no, they, city council decided along with that okay. concept, it's yeah. not. Yeah. But something had to happen in the hearts of people over the past 75 years to go from there to there. Bob? Okay, okay. But even, even homosexuality is, is much more popular today. Now, they wouldn't say that. The, the world would say there's just more people out of the closet now than there used to be. But I, I, I actually, I, I don't agree with that. Um, I, I don't think that we'd even see that in, in a trend through history. So let me just give you here I, a five-step process. And this isn't, this isn't scientific. This is just uh, my observation coupled with the observation of a, a number of other resources that I read into. And uh, this is basically how we, we travel down this path. And this is how we can travel down the path of any other sexual perversion or any other sin for that matter as well. And first is exposure. 
okay? Exposure to it. It was not that long ago that homosexuality was widely condemned. It, like any other sin, was not something people wanted known about themselves if they had those tendencies or even known about by people that didn't have those tendencies. But then it started showing up in media, okay? Uh, movies, TV shows, the masses were exposed to it. So I do think media played a, a huge role in this as it is in the division that's taking place in our world right now. So exposure, and then it was tolerated. Now the word tolerate is another word that has actually changed in definition o over time. But its original meaning, the original meaning to tolerate was to, to put up with it, okay? We don't like it, but I have to put up to it. Today, tolerate means to embrace it, all right? But homosexuality became tolerated. People began putting up with it. All right, they got this guy in my TV show. He was in the movies, in the book, whatever. They put up with it. They, they can do what they want, just don't push it on me. It became the weird, sinful aspect of, of books and movies. It became the, the perverted comic relief of entertainment. Still widely seen as sin, but it was that, that sinful indulgence of, of entertainment. And then, after it was tolerated, it became defended. Uh, the science world said, you know, it's, it's, it's genetic. Uh, they were born that way. They can't help it. A few weeks ago, we, we talked about addictions to drugs, alcohol, and the like. But where science, the science world says that too is, is genetic, they were born that way, it yet wants to fix that problem, okay? But with homosexuality, it is for some reason defended. They were born that way, they can't help it. Leave them alone, let, let them do it. Now again, I'm not a scientist, but even if there is a genetic aspect to homosexuality, if it brings harm and destruction, it's sinful. There might be a genetic aspect to, to addictions too. Different people may be born with different bents toward sin, different sins, okay? But that doesn't make that sin any more right, all right? It needs to be dealt with just like addictions. So it was defended, and then fourthly, it was endorsed, even by many who claim to be in the church. I read an article just recently. It was, it was on the Human Rights Campaign website, and it was entitled, What Does the Bible Say About Homosexuality? And in the article, uh, the author of the article, I believe, was actually a pastor. In the article, it agrees that the Bible nowhere paints a positive picture of homosexuality, but also says it must be interpreted in light of what the science world says about sexual orientation. So what, what does that mean? What are they really saying? What is that pastor really saying? The Bible is unscientific. Okay, the Bible is unscientific. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Above God. And what, what is, all right, what's above God? Okay, the science. The science is carrying more authority or the, what they, they say they know about sexual orientation, this pastor is saying carries more authority than what God says about sex. Um, he's saying that God's word is not the final authority on life and practice, that man's experience can override it. Well, what the, can that lead to? Man becomes his own God, and it can, there's no end, right? 
It can lead to anything goes. Anything at all goes. Rape may become tolerated, defended, endorsed. Maybe that's genetic too. In that same article, it claims that nowhere in the Bible, excuse me, it claims that nowhere does the Bible condemn consensual homosexuality, only non-consensual. That's what the article says. And in fact, here, let me just continue reading. This is part of the article. It says, while the six passages in the Bible, and there are roughly six, possibly seven, that address homosexuality. It says, while the six passages that address same-sex eroticism in the ancient world are negative about the practices they mention, this pastor that wrote the article says, there is no evidence that these in any way speak to same-sex relationships of love and mutuality. The article claims that each time the New Testament addresses the topic in a list of vices, the argument being made is more than likely about the sexual exploitation of young men by older men. And notice how he worded that, that it's more than likely. In other words, he doesn't know, all right, okay? And what we read, he continues, in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans is part of a broader indictment against idolatry and excessive self-centered lust that is driven by desire to consume rather than to love and to serve as outlined for Christian partnership elsewhere in the Bible. The article continues, while it is likely that the Jewish uh, the Jews and Christians in the first century had little to no aware, awareness of, the of, of a category like sexual orientation. It doesn't mean that the Bible authors were wrong. What it does mean, at a minimum, is that continued opposition towards same-sex re relationships and LGBTQ identities must be based on something other than these biblical texts, which brings us, he says, which brings us back to a theology of Christian marriage or partnership. And I think that's actually where he shot himself in the foot because uh, what is the theology of Christian marriage? Man and woman, okay, man and woman. Um, that's the nature of marriage. So let's go ahead and turn to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter 1, and we're going to read the passage that he's addressing here, which he says is uh, an ec a passage about exploitation uh, because of idolatry. So Romans chapter 1 and verses, we'll begin in verses 20, 24. Romans chapter 1. And verse 24, all right, and that does give us enough about the idolatry here too. So Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 24, it says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Okay, and then he says, for, for this reason, for, for idolatry reason, it says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature, Likewise, also, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And I'm going to stop there. So, first of all, is this describing homosexuality? Yes. Okay, very, very clearly it is. Is it described as natural or unnatural? Unnatural. unnatural. Is it described as good or bad? 
How is it described as bad? What are some words? Vile. Vile. Lust. Lust. My translation had shameful. It had error. All right. Here's another question. Is, is idolatry included in this passage? Yes. Okay, it, it is, it is. And while idolatry is being condemned here, um, it is because of idolatry that God gave them over to what he calls these vile passions. Um, what are those vile passions? It is the act of women with women and men, men with men. Those are called vile, lustful, shameful error. So concerning the, ar the article's argument that I read here a minute ago, of this speaking of, of some exploiting others, um, as we look at the, the homosexuality in this, in this passage, is it described as exploiting or is it, what's that? Consensual. How do you know it's consensual? He gave them the plural. Okay. Plural. Okay. And I think there's a phrase in there that says, lust for one another. Okay. So yeah, it, it, this is mutual. So this goes completely against what he stated in the article as it being an exploiting of older men exploiting younger men. No, this was, this was um, mutual. Um, it, so back to my five steps of how we walk our way down here. Gary? How could this pastor consider it good when obviously in the passage God is using it as a punishment? You'd have to ask him. <laughs> because I don't know. I don't know. All right. So it's endorsed, or excuse me, exposed, tolerated, defended, endorsed, and then fifthly, it's promoted. It's, it's, it's encouraged. People are encouraged to experiment with this, to be homosexual. In fact, those that come out about their sexual deviations they're considered brave. They're heroes today. Who doesn't want to be a hero? This perversion is being promoted even by some who call themselves Christians. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. Um, Second Timothy chapter four says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. There's the definition of the word perversion right there, and be turned aside to fables. Well, the time has come, and sexual perversion is just one area. Now, just before we get to the biblical view, and I am running out of time so fast here, just before we get to the biblical view and response, here are a few statistics, okay? The divorce rate among homosexual couples is almost twice that of heterosexual couples. What's the divorce rate of heterosexual couples? Almost 50%, okay? So that means almost 100% almost of homosexual marriages divorce. Um, in fact, rarely, statistically rarely, does a homosexual couple make it to 10 years. Here, another statistic. Attempted suicide is five times higher among those who claim to be homosexual. Five times higher. Now that said, and I, I, this is um, here's some more statistics that I gathered from a pro-homosexual website. Um, statistics show that pedophilia is dramatically higher, like 90% higher among heterosexuals than homosexuals. The argument being homosexuality is perhaps 
more wholesome then. In fact, there are numerous stats that show other perversions like fetishism and exhibitionism and incest higher among heterosexual couples rather than homosexual couples. So let me just ask you, why might that be? I, I, you, you say it's a lie. I, I actually don't think it's a lie. Studies indicate that upwards of 6% of homosexual men were molested as children. Okay, okay. I'm just wondering, what, what, what do you think about, uh, is there any logical reason for a stat like that? Let's just assume that it's true. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where the stats are coming from. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, I found these stats on, on several websites. But here, here's, here's my thinking on this. Um, I don't think that should surprise us because we're comparing one perversion to another perversion. Homosexuality, homosexuals are, are probably not into fetishism. They're into homosexuality. So of course, the other, the other perversions are gonna be lower against these who are drawn to this perversion. So obviously, heterosexuals are gonna be higher in stats in these other areas. So I, I just, I wanted to bring that up so that it gives you something to think about when you, if you go online and look up these stats, why is pedophilia 90% higher among heterosexual and homosexual? Well, pedophilia is not their bag, okay? Homosexuality is. So that's why the stats do that. The biblical view. The biblical view is sexual perversion of any kind is a sin, period. The biblical view is sexual perversion is a sin. God decides what is sin and what is not. He says, uh, do not participate in sexual perversion. Now I'm gonna read you a passage in, in, of scripture in Leviticus 18. Uh, in fact, if you wanna begin turning there, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 18. And this is another passage here that um, uh, that article that I read early, earlier actually referred to. It had it listed as, as a passage, and it also incorporates um, the idolatry again in it. But Leviticus chapter 18, I'm going to read it, pretty much the whole chapter, and we're going to make some observations, and um, just so you're aware, this is, uh, anyway... Um, this passage is probably the most graphic that we're going to get into tonight. Um, bear with me here, I'm reading 30 verses. Leviticus chapter 18, beginning in verse one. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. According to the doings of the land of Egypt, where you dwelt, you shall not do. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you, you shall not do, nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments with which if a man does, he shall live by them, I am the Lord. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother, mother you shall not uncover. She's your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father it is your father's nakedness, the nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether born at home or elsewhere, their nakedness you shall not uncover. Their, the nakedness of your son's daughter, or your daughter's daughter, their nakedness you shall not uncover, for theirs is your own nakedness. 
the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, begotten by your father. She is your sister. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. She is, she is near of kin to your father. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is near of kin to your mother. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. You shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, nor shall you take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. They are near of kin to her. It is wickedness, nor shall you take a woman as a rival to her sister to uncover her nakedness while the other is alive. Also, you shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is in her custody.
aversion is sin. God sees it as sin, and he hates it. He hates it. It's worthy of death. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 20, it echoes what we just read here in chapter 18, but also includes with it the penalty of death if you do it. What, what, is, what is worthy of the penalty of death in general in the Bible? Sin, sin. <laughs> okay. So there's no question we're, we're talking about sin. There's no way around it. Lastly, in the biblical view, we, we just to recap here. Um, all right. Biblical view, sexual perversion is a sin. God does hate sin. In fact, Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. So God hates sin. But lastly, in the biblical view, sin is destructive. Uh, The divorce rate among homosexual couples is twice that of heterosexuals. Uh, the, the suicide rate is five times higher among homosexuals. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let, let's go ahead and turn to that one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 9 through 11. Another way sin is destructive is it separates us from God's kingdom. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, what are, what are some of the forms of sexual perversion we find in that passage? Can you name them? Adultery. Adultery. Homosexuality. Fornicators, homosexuality. Sodomites, okay. And it depends on what translation you have. Sometimes you might even have one that says effeminate. Somebody have a translation that says effeminate. And it, the, the words are kind of reversed. Homosexuality, sodomite, sometimes are reversed in different translations. But that, that word effeminate actually speaks of a man acting like a woman for another man. Okay? That, that's effeminate. Is there any indication in this verse that these sins should discontinue among Christians? Yes. What, what does it say? Such were some of you. You were washed. You were cleansed. This is something, this is a practice that needs to end. In fact, I'll just make this statement. Um, I, I believe I, I believe this statement is, is, is biblical, okay, in light of what we've just looked at tonight. I don't believe that there are actually homosexual people. I think there are just very sinful people that are practicing homosexuality. So I actually, I kind of make it a point to not identify someone as a homosexual I, I'd rather identify them as someone who, who is practicing homosexuality because they too can be washed, okay? They, they, it can be a thing of the past for them as well, which leads us to our biblical response. And I think I've got like six minutes here, so we're gonna, we'll blitz through it. It's quick. Biblical response, hate the sin, love the sinner. Hate the sin, love the sinner. Um, we, we need to hate sin. I, I, I pray that sin, we hate it so much that it actually, it breaks our heart and makes us weep even sometimes to see how hurtful and destructive it is. In fact, Proverbs 8.13 says, the fear of the Lord 
is to hate evil. Psalm 97.10 says, you who love the Lord, hate evil. In respect for the Lord, we must hate what he hates. In Proverbs 6.16-19, 6, it says, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, one who sows discord among the brother. And that's really what the world is doing right now. It is, it is running to evil. It is in hot pursuit of it. Hate the sin, love the sinner, because, again, God does. Um, and I think one thing that we need to remember about ourselves is that we were in that sinner's place at one point in time, okay? We were at, at one point in time not, not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But Ephesians 2 says, But you he made alive, who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. I did, you did. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We need to hate the sin, but love the sinner, because God does, and he loved us once. He sent people into our lives that would love us regardless of the darkness we were walking in. And then thirdly, offer every sinner God's solution. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. People need the gospel. It's the only thing that's going to change them. Can uh, sexual, the, the sexually perverted be cured of their perversion? They can. They can. It has to happen spiritually first. It has to happen spiritually first. Know that the, the presence of sin will not be eradicated in this life. That only happens in, in, in eternity. But the solution for sins, uh, the, the solution for sin's presence won't take effect until then. But, but sin and temptation, it will always be present in this life. But through Christ, uh, anyone can be freed from the penalty of that sin and even the, the power of that sin. That's why Galatians 5.16 says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. All right, that is our, our time tonight. But thoughts, questions on what we've looked at? All right. I guess we are done. Let me, let me pray. Father, again, thanks. Um, we do look at the, the world around us right now, and, and it does break our heart. Uh, but, Lord, we understand as well that at one time we broke your heart. So we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the, uh, the opportunity that you have given us right here and right now. Uh, the opportunity for our godly lives to matter to those around us uh, through the truths we can communicate and the, the godly lives we can live. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.